That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Empty Man, uh, which is essentially the directorial debut of David Pryor, which has been dumped into theaters uh, with, uh, out any kind of um, publicity or anything by 20th Century Fox, aka Disney, October 23rd, 2020. I, so... Hadn't been in a movie theater since March, like, 14th. Mm -hmm. You haven't, yeah. I hadn't. So, saw this film in the theater in AMC in Chula Vista. Uh, I read reviews beforehand, mm -hmm. and they were not good. Mm -hmm. And the film is long. It's, like, over 2 hours, 15 minutes. It's 2 hours and 17 minutes, yeah. So, I was questioning seeing it. But I'm glad I did, because I liked it. I, too, I was very pleasantly surprised, especially, um, I, I don't know who's... Uh, reviews you were uh, reading beforehand because, trash uh, because the, <laughs> it wasn't reviewed by the trades and it wasn't um, like I didn't receive anything from any kind of publicist about this it was just dumped in the theater um, I'm surprised to learn this is a directorial debut yeah uh, he has directed a lot of uh, video shorts uh, affiliated with lots of films uh, what's the director's name David Pryor oh, good uh, job sir I if also, you identify as a man I don't know He's also the great grandson of uh, a couple violent, or violent, silent film stars. Uh, John Gilbert's his great grandfather. Oh. Well, um, the story. So the empty man is like an evil spirit, right? Like a demon, something like an entity that requires like a vessel, like a human vessel, and that vessel uh, needs to be someone who's open to it. So they, it's explained that it's someone who may be suffering from grief, loss, some sort of tragedy. Trauma, fear. Trauma, fear. Mm -hmm. And it's that emptiness inside that allows the empty man to insert um, themselves into the person. So um, the film starts with a group of four people in 1989 in Bhutan. 1995. 1995, Bhutan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're, uh, like, it's like a mountainous, snowy area, and they're going, like, rock climbing. So they ascend this mountain, cross a bridge. When they get to the top of the mountain, one of the gentlemen, Paul... Mm -hmm. Played by Aaron Poole. Oh, that's funny, because I thought he kind of looked like Aaron Paul. Oh, yeah, he does kind of look like wow. Aaron Paul, Aaron Poole, yeah. He's more attractive than Aaron Paul, but um, <laughs> but um, while they're up at the top of this snowy <laughs> mountain, Paul hears like the sa a sound that kind of sounds like a wind instrument. Mm -hmm. So they're on the top of this mountain, and he's like walking towards the edge of the cliff, saying like, don't you guys hear that? And he's getting like dangerously close to the edge when he falls into a crevice. Mm -hmm. So of course there's panic. The other gentleman who's part of the group... Um, dives down into the crevice to find him and what they find is Paul sitting uh, like crisscross applesauce in front of this like skeleton that's not human. Mm -hmm. It looks like it looks kind of like a human skeleton but it has like multiple appendages and it's mm -hmm. bigger than a person would be and Paul is just fixated on it mumbling something. The other friend, what's his name? Nathan? Greg. Greg. Greg drags him back up. They carry him back like over a bridge. They find like a, an abandoned cabin, mm -hmm. spend the night. When weird, thing, weird, weird things start happening, ultimately they find that Paul has walked back to the bridge and whatever has come over Paul is sort of like possessing the other three and they end up dying. Well, one he possesses one, she kills the two, and then he, then then she's possessed to like jump off the cliff. Yes. So fast forward to twenty eighteen Missouri. Yes. And we find a man named James. Yep. Oh wow. What's his What's this actor's name? James Badgedale. And his character's name is James. Yes, James Lasombra is the character. That's right. Mm -hmm. I liked James. Mm -hmm. So we, this we, we reviewed another film of him. I don't recall what film. Mickey and the Bear. He's the... Oh, I thought he was good in that film, too. Yeah. He's handsome, but he looks kind of like... He also played Tiffany Haddish's husband in the kitchen. He looked like he would beat you up after I had sex with you or something. <laughs> Which, whatever. But anyway... Oh, he's in a Tiffany Haddish movie? Yeah. In the Kitchen. Oh, I haven't seen that. Anyway, James runs like a security store. Mm -hmm. He's an ex-cop. Mm -hmm. We find him one day like meeting with this young girl named Helen. Amanda. Amanda. Amanda is the daughter of a woman named Helen. Nora. Quay. Nora. Who's Helen? Helen's from The Craft Legacy. Fuck. Which we'll be reviewing also. So, <laughs> so Amanda, 
this 18 year old girl played by Sasha Frolova who I liked she looks like a young pretty Scarlett Johansson and but creepy but creepy but creepy yeah and her bowl haircut was little, creepy little dead behind the eyes yeah yeah I like this but yeah she is the daughter of a friend of James uh Nora Quayle played by Marn Ireland who's also Nora. in The Dark and the Wicked which we just reviewed as well Wait. That's that lady? Yes. Wow, I did I liked her. I liked her in the Dark and the Wicked and I liked her in this movie. Yes, she's Wow. Old, yeah. Nora. Nora. So Nora and James are old buddies. Mm -hmm. Amanda goes to talk to James and she's talking like some how how would you describe it? Positivity. New agey kind New of agey. Uh, uh, controlling negative thought by invoking positive thought, etc. Yeah, like she'd have a vision board. Mm -hmm. So James is like, okay, whatever. James finds out she's gone missing. Mm -hmm. So he tells Nora, like, hey, I'll, I'll try to find her mm -hmm. since he has a background in law enforcement. So step one, he tries to find her friends. He's only, old, he's only able to locate one, mm -hmm. a black girl. Mm -hmm. And the black girl explains the empty man um, mythos, which is mm -hmm. not unlike Candyman or Bloody Mary. The whole premise is if you go to like an empty bridge and you blow into a bottle, and think about the empty man, you will conjure him. Mm -hmm. So on day one, you'll start to um, think about him. Day two, you'll see him. And day three, he'll make contact. I think day, is day one you hear him? No, oh, I thought it was think about him. Uh. Either way. So, <clears throat> of course, James takes that with a grain of salt. But he goes to try to find the other friends, and he's unable to. However, uh, two clues. He finds like literature for something called the Pontifex Society. Mm -hmm. Which Pontifex uh, it refers to uh, uh, a religious um, sect in Rome, but also literally means bridge makers. When he goes to Nora's house to, because the police are called because they can't find Amanda, in Amanda's bathroom on the mirror, written in what appears to be blood, it says the empty man made me do it. Mm -hmm. And when James goes to try to find another friend, he goes to the house, there's no, one, there's no one at the house, but he kind of rummages through it. He sees like a dog that's been like gutted. He kind of puts some things together. He decides to go to the bridge mm -hmm. and he does the, like the empty man call, it blows into the bottle. Some weird things happen. He ends up climbing into like a manhole and under the bridge, he finds the bodies of her four friends like hanging. So then we find out that Amanda had convinced her four little stupid friends to go to the bridge and call the empty man. Mm -hmm. And obviously it worked. Uh, and then the one, the, the student he did interview, we see her get killed by the entity in a sauna. That's right. The black girl gets killed in a sauna, like in a pretty creepy scene where like she stabs herself with the pair of scissors. Mm -hmm. um, so the bulk of the film from that point on is he goes to the Pontifex Society, which is kind of like... A le it almost looks like a Dianetics Institute yeah, like where you walk in and do a survey, like Scientology. Scientology, yeah. And he goes to like a meeting where he meets like their leader played by... Uh, Stephen Root playing Arthur Parsons. Who I recognized. Uh, you probably... I just watched him play a very homophobic father and uncle Frank. Uh, Get Out, he is the one... He's the blind photographer that wants to take over... That's um, him. Danny Kule as... Yeah. Interesting. I mean, he's in a ton of stuff. But yeah. But uh, very well done. Um... It's pretty complicated and layered, but basically him finding out about the Pontifex Society and hearing what they have to say, he discovers through a series of events that the empty man, like the, the evil entity, needs a body. And Paul from Bhutan 1995 was the body that the empty man spirit has been using, but that body's about to die. He's laid out in this... He's in some ICU unit on life Missouri. support in yeah. Missouri. And we find out that prior to Paul, it had been 500 years since the Empty Man spirit was able to find a, an appropriate vessel. So now this, these members of the Pontifex Society who like worship the Empty Man spirit, they decided they're going to conjure up like a vessel. They need a new beacon. They need a new, yeah. and James is it. So they've fabricated him because they don't have 500 years to wait. But he's not the first one. They've, the, the, they call them manifestations. Which we'll get to in yeah. greater detail, but yeah, they've tried multiple times, couldn't, mm -hmm. but then they find James. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of the bulk of the film, like I would say 
like an hour and a half is him sort of understanding what this is and how what role he plays in it. Ultimately, um, he succumbs to his fate, mm -hmm. which is he needs to um, be used by the Empty Man. So he kills Paul, who's in the ICU, and then the Empty Man spirit invades James' body. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was um, engaged the entire time. It was very interesting. I think the story, like the, the mythos of the Empty Man is interesting. I think James, the actor character, mm -hmm. was very watchable. I really liked Amanda. I liked um, sort of the people he interacts with in the Pontifex society. The leader guy, like the speech, the speech, the one big speech he gives was very um, well, interesting. Well, and then he has a very good scene with Stephen Rode where James Badgedale sits him aside, and that's where um, we get that really great moment where he's talking about Nietzsche. Uh, when you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares into you, and how that yes. profundity has become cliche and. When something becomes repetitive and cliche, it becomes meaningless, it becomes empty. Yeah. And then you start to see the pattern of how they construct um, James's character, who is always talking about how he's from San Francisco. and. Uh... So the, the motif of repetition is, mm -hmm. yeah, like, like after we learn that, it's like, oh yeah, he does do a lot of things repetitively. So like they're almost like brainwashing him. Mm -hmm. Uh, which, which, you know, you can take uh, even further in a lot of other directions, I think, about religion and yeah. <laughs> how we control people. Just going down my list, like you mentioned, the manifestations that this group had tried previously that didn't work. Um, we, as the audience, we see it because James finds out that they, because his, throughout the entire film, he's trying to find Amanda. So he's told that Amanda is like at some cabin somewhere. So he goes... And it really does feel like Scientology, how Scientology has like their camp like somewhere like well, in Florida. Well, even the Wikipedia thing he reads like their past incidents is in the Mark Twain Reserve or whatever in this forest in Missouri. And um, that was also a good scene. We get a lot of exposition from James, like literally clicking links in Wikipedia. And initially I thought this is corny, but it ended up working out really well because if whatever, I thought it was well done. But he goes to this like remote cabin in what I thought was a really creepy scene because, or in like a series of events, because he goes into this cabin, he's rummaging through things, he finds a file cabinet with all the kids who he was looking for, like their files, but then he finds his own file. Which is empty and, which is and red. And red, creepy. Then he finds some VHS tapes that say like <laughs> manifestation, blah, 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 number 13, whatever, and he starts watching them and we see that like they're trying to conjure up these people who are like not quite taking, but they're kind of deformed. There's this Nosferatu looking man. <laughs> yeah, and there's like a teddy bear in the corner that starts moving and yeah. disappears. That was creepy. Then he leaves the cabin in like this secluded woodsy area and he comes upon like, like a hundred of these members sort of like dancing around a fire mm -hmm. that rises like That's supernaturally tall. And then it immediately goes out and it's dark and silent. And then they all like look at him, but he's like kind of far away from them and they start chasing him. That was really well done and creepy. Um, what else do I have here? The um, he, he ends up, there, there's also another side character who kind of gives him, he's the one that gives him the info about where oh, the young guy is, mm -hmm. that's talking like an old beat. And he's like, what's with the Neil Cassidy shtick? Um, which is also interesting. And this is based on a, a series of graphic novels, which, uh, I, I, there's probably a lot more lore they couldn't even pack in here, but th that's an interesting element. But he follows this kid with a group of others to the, that's where he finds um, Paul in the ICU. And he goes back there and talks to the nurse. And I thought that was a really good the scene. The nurse too. was a really good scene because at first you're thinking like she's like she doesn't know what's going on, but really, literally everyone in the, that hospital knows about mm -hmm. the empty man and who Paul is in the ICU. Well, because he starts out saying like, I need to know about this patient. She's like, I can't tell you anything. But he starts asking vague questions that start um, yielding more and more kind of complex, creepy answers. Yeah, but that sort of like evolution of her interacting with him, I thought was really It's really well good. Done. And then all of a sudden she's like, well, he's like, can I go in there? She's like, yeah, by all means, there's someone in there right now. <laughs> yeah. More things I liked. There are some really good shots. I thought, first of all, the opening scene, which is probably what, like 15 minutes, 17 minutes mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> before the oh, the title credit comes on, were there in Bhutan, I thought was really good, really um, well done. It was shot by Anastos Anas Michos, who um, 
has been the cinematographer in a lot of things, but notably lensed uh, Man on the Moon from Milos Forman. Uh, but, but there's one scene, it's where there's a, a map. Um, That's a really good shot. And, and it's just a physical map, and then it, it becomes the, the terrain that we get like almost like a drone's perspective of yes. that segues down into him driving, uh -huh. which is a lot like the beginning of Midsummer. Um, there are shots on that. Like, yeah, it looks there great. are a lot of like little visual effects, like little small details that I really appreciate. Like, clearly, it was well thought out. Mm -hmm. A lot of attention and care was, you know, put into <clears> that. So I really appreciated that. Um, so within the story is this Pontifex society, and then we have several scenes like where we're within the society and the people talking. I thought that was really well done, and you know, I don't know anything about the graphic novel. I don't know how in depth the novel goes into it or how many issues of this novel there are but i thought that it was really really well executed i agree uh i, I think this shot back in 2017 and uh, and i don't know why it was delayed of course the world's crazy right now but i think 20th century fox and disney by dumping it into theaters you have like sporadic people going to see this in theaters not really realizing this is kind of an art house horror film so it, it's not surprising to me that this has like a D plus on cinema score, score or whatever and uh, what I was very impressed so two things that kind of threw me off when Amanda explained because there's a scene at the end where Amanda explains to James like what they did to him and what their intentions are like it's very well clearly laid out Amanda explains that they created him. Mm -hmm. And I was a little confused on whether that meant like the existence that, is the, that the audience understands he had before was not real and that they sort of created that story for him or if he was a real person and they just sort of overtook his mind. So, I mean, that wasn't clear, right? It's, it's not clear and also she's this teenager so then she also would have been, had to have been fabricated and her mother... Um, Nora would also have to be a fabrication. So um, that tiny component of the storyline is was it, it did threw me off because it wasn't clear to me. It that's true, but I also don't need everything explained to me. No. I'm fine with some ambiguity. Well, um, I don't think it's ambiguity. I was just confused. Like what? Like what are you saying, girl? Like, <laughs> but not a big mark off. Also, so the probably the only acting job I didn't like is there is a like a cop like a detective the main detective who's kind of looking for Amanda and then also talking about all these murders that happened mm -hmm. he's this black guy I don't I don't he's know a, the he's, actor he's a character actor he's been in a ton of stuff Ron Canada is his that name. that means the combination of the writing of that character and his acting I thought were the crunchiest part of this movie. sure I think he has the misfortune of he was supposed to deliver a certain kind of exposition very quickly um, but that's it. Otherwise, I was very impressed by this film. I would actually watch it again. I would definitely recommend it. Well, the, you... the original Wicker Man is one of my favorite things. Robin Hardy's The Wicker Man. So this, and this is obviously, even by title, you know, this is somebody being groomed to be a, a victim or to be used in this greater cult's um, organization, uh, which is always interesting to me. Um, Some of the things I read about it, like one person said, like, oh, it's like the Slender Man or the Bye Bye Man. Like, this is worse. This film is like... No. Much more elevated than those two films. Yeah, I agree. What would you give this movie? Three and a half out of five. I would give it three and a half out of five as well. Thank you. Thank you.